I'm going to show you a couple of extreme batteries that you may think are really interesting. First, we'll start with the old school. This one's called the Oxford Electric Bell. It was built 193 years ago by some instrument makers, Watkin and Hill, in London. And then 15 years later, in 1840, it was purchased by a physics professor at the University of Oxford and set up on display in the physics lab. These are dry piles here and of the materials at the time they probably used something like silver foil, zinc foil, or maybe copper foil and zinc foil and a piece of paper or fabric in between those that was coated with a light paste of maybe manganese dioxide which was some material that was you know available at that time period and there's about a thousand of those in each one of these dry pile stacks here that's a lot and then what they did is they put a bottom and, and top piece here you can see the four pieces you can't see the one in the back but it, it appears to have a, a I guess a string I thought it might be a wire but it looks more like string here that they tie very very tightly to compress these things and, and then once it was compressed and, and tied off it was coated in molten sulfur to lock in whatever moisture might have been in the manganese dioxide paste so that's just what supposedly it's made of nobody really knows because since 1840 it's been running constantly and so they, they figure that the bell has rung 10 billion times. It's just amazing. And what it does is this, these are connected in series. Again, we can see up here that uh, on the, the connection on the brass arch here. Also, you can see this is a silk fiber that's tied off here. You can see it hanging down here. It goes down to the little bell clapper. But they're in series, so what it would do is terminate in one of the bells being positive and the other being negative. I don't know which is which, but it's an electrostatic device. 2,000 volts this thing made when it was new. I don't know what it makes now, but it's probably still pretty high. And each time it rings against one bell, it consumes one nano amp. So there's really no current. This is all electrostatic, just high voltage. And so what it does is when the little clapper little ball clapper hits one of the bells it's charged according to that bell and then repelled and then it hits the other bell charged accordingly and it goes back and forth and oscillates at about two hertz being an electrostatic device the problem with this is humidity is its enemy it has on occasion I've I've read where it has stopped a few times for a short period of time because the humidity levels apparently in the room became excessively high and any elect electrostatic device isn't going to work well when there's any kind of humidity at all. Much like having your shoes shuffling along on a carpet in a, on a winter's day when the air is cool and dry and you can touch something metal, a doorknob or, or someone else even and get a little spark off of that. Well that's the, uh, that's the conditions that electrostatic devices like the most. They like it dry, very very dry. The next device I'm going to show you is another extreme battery, and it's just the opposite of this. The only thing similar between this and the cells that are in the Oxford Electric Bell is they both use two dissimilar metals and an electrolyte. This, on the other hand, has very, very thick alloys. One's an alloy metal, the other is graphite, but it has alloy in it, and it's a half an inch by two inches, very, very thick plates. And this actually makes current and it'll light this LED, whereas the Oxford Electric Bell is electrostatic and only has specific applications that can be useful for. So, but if you take four of these and put them together, you would come up with this size, which is two inches square. You divide this into four pieces and you've got the black parts that you see inside there of these cells. Now the chrome parts that you see are neodymium magnets. They're exactly the same size as these cells because when I made this in November of 2015, I didn't really want a mechanical compression because these cells need to be compressed to get the, the maximum usefulness out of them. 
all the large ones that I make, I use nylon nuts and bolts to hold them together nice and tight. But in this case, it was just one of the test devices I was making in the fall of 2015. So I used these Neos and made the cells the same size as the Neos. And it holds them really nice. In fact, it gives them a chance to expand in case they were going to do some odd thing like the copper zinc and copper magnesium cells that you may have seen with bunches of salts and stuff. And those things just blowed out and rupture. So I thought, okay, well, this will give it some expansion if it's going to do that. But after two and a half years of running an LED, powering the LED consistently, it hasn't done anything. So we're, so we're doing good so far. It's pretty cool. I mean, it looks just the same. I did take this cell, I did take the LED off a couple of times when I did some extreme tests on the cells themselves. Put them in the freezer for a couple of hours and... And uh, I put them under a heat gun, I had them in the sun, oh, all kinds of things. I put them in mineral oil for a little bit just to see what would happen. And, you know, everything I could possibly do to kill these darn things, and they still just kept coming back. But one fascinating thing that I found was in certain conditions, especially in the sun, the, the cells would form condensate. They'd actually sweat. Well... <laughs> The, the electrolyte in between is a paste. It's just this fiber in with a paste on it at that time. That's what I did for this uh, little array of cells. And, and so it's not like it's got a quart of water in there that it can just sweat and, you know, drip, drip, drip. But yet it, it uh, forms condensate. So the, the graphite is so thermally conductive and it's porous enough that it absorbs atmospheric humidity and the cells sweat. So I thought, wait a minute, you know, there's really something cool here that I must be missing. So I built this little device here and I put the cells that they're suspended from the top here. There's two vent holes in the top and little pins that hold a fish line that holds this in suspension. Here's a closer look at the cells themselves. And you can see that uh, on the ends, I just used a piece of stainless steel and folded it over and marked it red for the positive on this side and and um, and it holds the magnets uh, hold the little flap that's folded over tightly together and so it uh, keeps me from having to solder and uh, makes a nice little connection there and then black on the other side that's pretty much it and it's suspended in this terrarium box for a reason I wanted to create an environment that was always wet always damp now right now you don't see any condensate on it because I'm underneath fluorescent lights so that I could do this video for you. But typically if I put it on a windowsill or even if it's got bright incandescent lights or something that's producing any kind of a, of a heat source or a really bright light source other than these fluorescents and LEDs, the condensate will form inside the container because in the bottom here you can see there's a substance in there which is a really rich black swamp peat moss and I loaded it up with um, distilled water until it bloated up it was just a little bit in there and it bloated up like crazy but when when this gets condensated inside you can actually see the cells actually dripping water they're just covered in water and the and the LED will be just as bright as can be up on top here. Now that's one other thing I wanted to mention. This is just a laser cut lens here that sits on top here that allows a, a light beam from the, it's a five millimeter LED and uh, the beam goes straight up and then off on two different angles and it kind of makes a nice little light show in the wall and ceiling at night but that's that's all the purpose for that is. As another test I took a lithium battery like this, it's a double A size, it's, uh, it's a 14500 uh, style and it's uh, 2,000 milliamp hours at 3.7 volts but I took one of these another green LED just like this one connected it to this battery it has enough voltage to power it and after three or four days running day and night the battery is dead and needs to be recharged this has been running and powering this light for two and a half years and doesn't need recharging at all so there's really something awesome about this particular technology and, uh, and two centuries of, of operation with the, the Oxford Electric Bell kind of proves the physics behind this that yes, there is some longevity. There are the two extreme batteries. One is totally isolated from the environment and the other uses environmental humidity as a catalyst. Pretty cool. 
Take a look at uh, some of our other videos on, on this material. Uh, come visit us on the website at quantummagnetics.com. See some of the cool machines and kits that we produce and offer to the public. Thanks.